Hi everyone, my name is Shradhna and today we're going to talk about how to get more value from your unit test. We will cover common issues faced in unit testing well and some interesting approaches to solve them. Of course, we are all good developers, so we already know why we unit test. But let's go through the main benefits of unit testing anyway to see if we can ease our way into this topic. By writing tests, we ensure that our code works in a way that it is it was intended to. And this also helps us to avoid the debugger. Tests also prevent regression issues, meaning a failing test will notify us if we have broken something that was working before. When we refactor our code, our test results will indicate if our code is still working. The ability to confidently refactor our code leads to improved design. These are some of the issues that we are going to talk about today. Let's go through them one by one. In my experience, this is one of the first blocker that comes up. Difficulty to write test for a piece of code. The code could be either in a POC stage or maybe a part of some legacy code base. It's almost always a red flag when, the when a piece of code is hard to test. It either has too many dependencies or there are too many things going on in the method, which means that it violates the single responsibility principle. Let's look at an example. This is a simple to-do list API. Seems like the main method is creating a to-do and a reminder. And then depending on the network availability, it's doing some stuff on the repository. When I think about how I can write tests for this, sort, this kind of code, this is how I look like. After analyzing the, this code, it is clear that it has too many responsibilities. In other words, it violates single responsibility principle. According to this principle, a piece of code should have one and only one responsibility and therefore a single outcome. Well, if this method had one outcome only, it would have been so much easier to test. Let's go ahead and break down these responsibilities. Here, the code is broken down into a standard structure. The sole purpose of to-do list would be to manipulate to-do items in the list. The to-do repository would be responsible for saving to-dos. In this case, to-do repository is a protocol. The implementation of the repository will be selected based on network reachability like before. When we test our new method, this is what it looks like. The test is very clear and specifies what is expected from the method itself. It almost reads like a sentence. Let's try to read it. Given I have a new to-do list, when I add a to-do, then the to-do should be present inside the list and must be saved into the into appropriate repository. Now, if we look at our new code under test, we can see that it has one external dependency, which is the to-do repository. How can we verify this behavior? We can use mocks or test doubles. What is mocking? Mocks or test doubles are ways to replace external dependencies with stand-ins. This way, all methods are called on the stand-in instead of real objects. This is very useful to achieve unit isolation when testing. And it also gives us the ability to focus on code under test without worrying too much about the external code. How can we do this? You can either create an empty implementation by hand and have your test code call that instead of the dependency object. There are also a number of useful mocking frameworks to help with this. They usually make mock creation way easier but sometimes a lot of setup is required to get there. So you can take your pick based on your use case. Let's see how our test can use mocks to verify the behavior of external dependency. First, we create a mock object for the repository. Then we simply inject it when creating the to-do list. So our mock will be used instead of the real repository. Now using this mock, we can verify that the save method is indeed called on the mock repository. We are also verifying that the method is called with correct argument, which is the to-do item, 
that was created before. In case you're wondering about the strange syntax of the verify statement, I've used the mocking framework called cuckoo here. Now, I want to share a very simple tip that is immensely helpful for writing clearer tests. The three magical words, given, when, then. How is this useful? Let's look at a sample code and implement the tests. This method implements the feature to remove to-do. Of course, we can only remove the to-do item if it exists. If it doesn't exist, we throw an exception with a custom error. This method already has one single responsibility, so it should be easy to test. Let's see how we can use those three magical words now. Given I have a to-do list with an item, when I remove the existing item, then it should not be present in the list. Sounds good. Let's write our test and code on those lines. After converting those sentences into code, this is how it looks like. Given the to-do list has one item in it, when I remove it, it should not be present. Notice how dividing the code into three sections instantly makes it more readable. Now, looking at the implementation for remove to-do again, the code actually has two paths, the happy path, which we just tested, and an error path with the guard statement, which throws an exception. We already tested the happy path. Let's see if we can test the error path. Using the given when then syntax again, this should be the test for error path. Given I have an empty to-do list, when I try to remove a non-existing to-do item, then an exception to-do does not exist should be thrown. Sounds simple enough. Let's look at the test. We first test that the error is thrown. Then the error gets captured in this little closure. And then we assert that the error is indeed the does not exist error. Notice that I haven't added my given when then comments in this test method. But once we get into the habit of using those words, our tests will consistently get divided into three sections and all our tests will be similar so it would be really easy to read. Let's look at the next problem. What exactly are fragile tests? Tests are fragile if they fail without changing behavior of the system under test. Example, sometimes refactoring our code to improve design results in failing tests. This outcome is certainly not desirable. Of course, if we change functionality, tests will need to be updated. But if tests break on refactor, it takes away one of the major benefits that tests give us. So why does this happen? One of the major indicators of this is tight coupling between production code and test code. The argument here is that even if the test code and production code describe the same behavior, the structure shouldn't necessarily be the same. Let's look at an example. Todo Manager has a Todo service and Todo service has a Todo repository. To fetch Todos, the calls call flows from manager to service and then service to repository. Let's look at the test for this Todo service. Okay, this is how the test looks like. If you look at the then block, of this test, we can see that the test verifies that fetch to do's method is called on the repository when fetch to do's is called on the service. This kind of test only improves coverage. The test code is practically same as the production code, and hence this is a classic case of redundant test. Let's see how we can solve this problem. What if we omit the to do service test completely? Then we can test the to-do service code via the manager. To do that, when we test the to-do manager, we inject real service instead of a mock service. So in that way, this, the code inside the service is covered. Well, you might say now it has become an integration test and it's not a unit test anymore. Well, in this particular case, it's not really a integration test yet. The main difference between unit test and integration test is that integration test 
don't mock third party dependencies and in our case we are still mocking third party dependencies we are just not using mocks for our own classes we have basically changed the definition of unit in this case what really is the definition of unit well unit was never defined as a single class or a single method multiple classes can be created for a very very simple task and a small group of classes can be isolated and can be called a unit for instance let's look at the previous example again in this case the to do package has all these classes and the package exposes the to do manager to the outside world so actually the to do service exists only for the to do manager in and in that case nobody is ever going to use the to do service independently so it is okay to not test it independently we can still cover the code inside to do service from the to do manager like most things in software development there is no silver bullet you know your code better than anyone and you can define what a unit is main purpose is to find out how we can test the behavior of our api effectively this kind of thinking leads to clearer and more maintainable tests and still if we want to test some class separately we should definitely do that but now that we know that tight coupling could impact effectiveness of our test we should always keep an eye out for these sorts of problems when i came across this problem i started to find if there are other resources related to this i found many references especially in the tdd world i came across the term test contravariance which was coined by robert martin author of the famous clean code book i've also linked some posts that discuss this idea in detail if you love reading books instead both of these touch on the subject of tightly coupled unit tests and have a wealth of other information related to refactoring and unit testing all right let's move on to the next issue test suite maintenance not having meaningful tests is one of the reasons why test suites are hard to maintain and of course this issue also goes hand in hand with our last issue fragile tests are mostly the ones that are hard to maintain let's look at an example of tests that are not meaningful okay let's read through this name given i have a foo when i call set bar with 3 then get bar should return 3 when these kinds of tests fail it is hard to know what went wrong and maintenance is really difficult let's see how meaningful tests look like this is the test suite that is associated with the to do list class that we have looked at before Let's read through some of the tests. Test to do list should be empty when initialized. Test should add to do with text less than two hundred characters. Test should not add to do with text more than two hundred characters, and so and so on. These sorts of tests are really easy to understand, and if they fail, you know exactly what has gone wrong. The important thing to note is that the test name. are same as the list of requirements provided in the product requirement document and all of our unit tests actually are same as the list of requirements here so what has happened now our tests have become our specifications this is a common association in the tdd world but actually it has nothing to do with tdd even if you write test after you code they should still be like specifications of your api or product but why is this so important what actually happens when your tests are same as your specifications well first thing you get is live documentation of the product <laughs> and like most documentations this one is guaranteed to be accurate and uh, the next benefit is of course we uh, our test will help us understand what a particular piece of code is doing and why we care about it this is a huge benefit because we spend so much more time reading code than writing it all right moving on to another issue incomplete test suite 
Of course, we won't get any of these amazing benefits from our unit test if we don't have enough tests. Well, how can we extend our test suite? Obviously, you have to write more tests to extend your test suite. Sadly, it doesn't always happen. Developers don't have a lot of time to spend exclusively on writing tests, especially for code that already exists. Here's an idea. A lot of our time is spent on fixing bugs. So next time you find a bug, you first write a test for it. This is a pretty inexpensive way of adding more tests and improving your test suite. Consider this scenario. When I gave a prototype of my to-do app to my PM, she highlighted this bug. Looks like a classic case of unclear requirement. Since there was a requirement that the to-dos should not have special characters, the developer excluded all special characters. But apparently, a period character should be allowed in a to-do text in the to-do text. All right. Let's look at the test that we had originally written to meet the requirement. It's a simple test that fails if we try to add a to-do with special characters. Here I'm writing a new test for a bug that was reported. It's simply creating a to-do with a period character in it and expecting that to-do to exist. Of course, when we run this test, this test will fail. Now I'm going to update the code to make the test pass. The fix is pretty simple. We've updated our regex to include a period character. Next step is to run the test that we wrote earlier. All right, the test has passed and here's that beautiful green tick mark that we all wait to see. Well, after going through this cycle, does this sound like TDD? Yes, it is. But even if you don't practice TDD, I encourage you to try this. It's a very subtle but simple way of strengthening your test suite. And the best part is that you will never encounter the same bug again. All right, let's summarize what we talked about today. Code that is hard to test should be simplified. Tight coupling is almost always a bad idea. Test should describe what is expected of the API instead of gluing the structure of production code to test code. Test should be treated as live documentation of your APIs. This helps with test maintenance and clarity. Always write a failing test for your bug, making your test suite stronger with minimal effort. This is a very, very inexpensive way of making your test suite stronger. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening so far. And thanks to the team at ISConfessG for giving me the opportunity to speak at this conference. I've been attending this conference for over five years, so this is almost like a dream come true. Uh, a small side note, I work for Rakuten Wiki, who's also sponsoring this conference. And we're looking for iOS engineers and Android engineers. So if you are interested, reach out to me or the team. Thank you and have a great conference. Oh, 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 oh,